Good morning. Good morning. We'll try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks so much for being here. You lucky few here in person and online who were able to roll with the time change and be here. I'm glad you're here. I hope that you are glad you're here and together we will do this thing called church. I'm Thomas Mitchell, your associate minister. I'm joined on the chancel this morning by Jess Cusick, our supply minister, Helen Frederick, our liturgist, Josh Silberman, our director of music, our choir, fantastic as always, and we are joined by each and every one of you, whether you're here in person or online. Again, I'm so glad you're here this morning. If you're brand new to being here, we want to know. There is a guest book online. There's a link in your chat that should have popped up right about now. There will be a link to our first time visitors page. Copy and paste that link into your browser and just tell us who you are, how you found us, and tell us your email address. That way we can write you back and maybe invite you to coffee or tea. If you're in the sanctuary, there's a guest book right outside the door on the right as you leave this morning. I've got a few announcements to share with you. One of them is just to note that my voice is a little bit hoarse this morning. There were two basketball games yesterday, Lady Vols and the men's team. Um, both big games for different reasons. They both lost. Um, however, they were in it until the very end, and that is why there's some, a bit of hoarseness this morning. The more important announcements to share with you is that this morning's um, offering, whether it's loose cash or you designate that gift on an envelope will support the UCC's one great hour of sharing that will again be part of our offering this morning. That will be the loose cash, loose cash in the plate or a designated gift on an envelope that's provided for you. Um, celebration for our sandwich packing team. They packed all 75 lunch kits this morning after the 9 a.m. service. So there's nothing for y'all to do this afternoon. Um, except maybe find some other volunteer opportunity to take that time slot when you leave here today. Council will meet at 12.15 in the fellowship hall. The goal is to start right on time at 12.15. So if you want to listen in and be a part of that um, discussion, we'll be in the fellowship hall at 12.15. Join us there. I do want to note this um, verbally. It's there written in your bulletin. Um, but note that beginning this Monday, the church office hours are changing to Tuesday through Friday. 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. So we've been doing Monday through Friday um, for a while. Going forward again, beginning tomorrow, this will be church office hours or 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. Tuesday through Friday. You can, of course, send an email, make a phone call, but it will not be returned until Tuesday, beginning at 9 a.m. And we hope that this change will just help us um, right-size a few things and have a bit more intentionality about some of the stuff we're doing and on the office staff end of things. And the last note I've got for you is a spruce up for Easter workday. This will be Saturday, March 23rd, right before Palm Sunday. This is a big day. Um, as you know, this season for Palm Sunday and Easter, a lot more folks show up um, in our sanctuary, in our doors, in this beautiful building. And so we want to be able to provide them the same welcome that many of you got many years ago. Um, so we want that to be a space of real beauty. Um, we want there to be a clean pond, clean stones, trash is removed, all those little low bar things that sometimes we kind of miss throughout a month or season. Um, again, March 23rd, 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. Come out, help us spruce up our space outdoors to provide a beautiful visual welcome to our community for these two really big days, um, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And with that, my siblings, again, I'm so glad you're here and I'm going to ask Helen Frederick to lead us in our call to worship. Please stand as you are able and join in the call to worship. Rejoice, beloved, for Jesus is in our midst. Feed us, Feed us and fill and us with hope. Be glad, friends, Jesus has bread and fish to spare. Free us, us from the pursuit, pursuit of food, food that, that does not satisfy. Sing for joy, people of God. God, God gathers up the, the pieces of our lives that, that nothing may be lost. Please continue standing for our opening hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together, number 330 in the New Central Hymnal.
be seated. Today's words for meditation are by Rachel Held Evans. Our God is in the business of transforming ordinary things into holy things, scraps of food into feasts. This God knows their way around the world, so there's no need to fear, no need to withhold, no need to stake a claim. There's always enough, just taste and see. There always and ever enough. Our scripture reading this morning is the story, A Hungry Crowd, which is a faithful retelling of Mark 6, verses 30 through 44, as it is found in our children's storybook Bible, The Peace Table. Jesus and his disciples were tired and hungry. They left in a boat for a quiet place where they could rest and eat. The crowd saw them leave and hurried to the place where Jesus was going. The crowd got there first. Jesus got out of the boat and looked at the people with love. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. That evening, Jesus' disciples said, send the crowds away so that they can go buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, you feed them. The disciples were surprised. How could they possibly feed a crowd of 5,000 people? It would cost so much money. Jesus said, go and see how much bread there is. The disciples found five small loaves of bread and only two fish. Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups of 50 and 100. He took the bread and fish, looked up to heaven, and blessed the food. The disciples passed out the food. Everyone ate until they were full. The disciples even gathered 12 baskets of leftovers. For the still speaking voice of God, thanks, thanks be to God. God. Friends, this is the time that we set aside for the story for all ages. This is a story for everyone. And as is my way, everyone will participate today. In the words of my very good friend who is an elementary school art teacher, we will put our participants on and we will all participate together. And so, just as Helen read for us, we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000 in which Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, other than the resurrection of Jesus, this is the only story that occurs in all four of the Gospels. There's many stories that occur in three of the four, or two of the four, or sometimes one of the four, perhaps some of the most confusing of them all. But this is the one, besides the resurrection, that appears in all four of our Gospels. And I think that that means that we should pay extra, extra attention to this story. In this story, Jesus takes five loaves and two fish, and you'll see here, how many loaves do I have? Five, that's right. I have five. I have no fish because I am a good colleague and a good coworker. And the 11th word of God, the 11th commandment is, thou shall not bring fish or reheat fish in thy place of work. <laughs> so I only have bread today, but this is all we need for today. Now, friends, will you all help me? Will you pass these baskets around in the sanctuary? And I want everyone to take a piece. So y'all go ahead, take it to everyone. Walk around, make sure everybody gets a piece. Everyone break off your own piece. I want you to take what you need. Go ahead. You can do it. I promise. Here, you go this way. To everyone. Yeah, just a little piece to everyone. Yeah. Everyone take what you need. In this story, one of the things that's most interesting is that some of the gospel writers say that it was 5,000 people that Jesus fed, and in others it says 5,000 men that Jesus fed, and women and children. And so the number that Jesus fed may have exceeded 5,000, which is truly amazing. There's not 5,000 people in this room, but I think that the, the narrative will still hold as we pass this around. Will you take some to the choir? Yeah. 
And friends who are online, I trust and believe that there would be enough for you if you had the opportunity to be in the room, but hold space for what's about to happen as we pass these baskets around. All right. We have some left already. Well, let's maybe let's see if Bob needs more in his basket. All right. We're coming around. It's happening. And then whatever is left, I want you all to bring that back to the front. And let's see what's happened. <gasps> Thank you. Let's make sure. Reverend Thomas, did you get a piece? You got a piece. All right. Well, I will also take a piece. All right. Come right back down to the front. Very good. Everyone got some. Okay, friends, let's look around. I want everyone to hold up their piece of bread. You can have one, yeah. I want everyone to hold it up. I already ate it. Okay, well, that's great. But, friends, let's look. We still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of bread left in the baskets. And I think that this illustrates what Jesus has done because you can eat it if you would like. It's gluten-free, so enough for everyone. But this story that Jesus told us, when he passed around food to everyone, he said, take what you need. And isn't it amazing how when we just take what we need that there's always more than enough? And if we all operated in our lives in this way, that there might always be more than enough. And I think that this story resonates for us in lots of ways, that there's always enough to share, enough food, enough resources, enough love, enough kindness. Because whenever we take just what we need, those who know what it's like to be hungry know that they don't want anyone else to feel hungry. And those who know what it's like to feel injustice know that they don't want anyone else to feel an injustice towards them. And so the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't just a miracle because it fed 5,000 people. But it was a miracle because Jesus showed us that when we truly take just what we need, there's always enough to share. There's always enough to go around. The world is always big enough and wide enough and more wonderful than we can even ask or imagine. So may there always be more than enough in the baskets because everyone took exactly what they needed and still there was more for us to share. Will you pray with me? Let's repeat after me. Dear God, Thank you for showing us that there is more than enough. May we always share what we have so that no one goes hungry and no one feels hurt because we know that when we love, that we are taking care of one another the way that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, you can go back to your seats. There, yeah, you want to take it? So last week, Reverend Jess spent some time talking about similarities among the four Gospels and the possible existence of a common source called Q. I will not go into much of that this morning, um, but I will note, as Jess, Reverend Jess did in our story for all ages, that this story of Jesus seeding the 5,000 is the only miracle, apart from resurrection, recorded in all four Gospels. And what a powerful miracle that is. So this morning, throughout the sermon, I think we're going to follow a few of the prompts included in our storybook Bible for this story. 
and I will try to offer about three lenses through which we might make meaning of this miracle in our lives today. In keeping with the prompt found under the prayer part for the story in the, in the peace table, I want to invite you this morning as we pray to in, invite you to imagine Jesus looking at you with love. Will you pray with me? Holy One, thank you for our time together this morning in this house of worship, this house of beauty and splendor, this house where all of your creation seems to spring forth from our seats, from the windows, from all the space in which we inhabit. In our time together, might we discern your still speaking voice and still moving spirit in our lives. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our story opens with a note that I think is perhaps not always considered when we think about the work of Jesus and his disciples. They were tired. They were hungry. They needed to rest. Jesus and the disciples, we might imagine to be workhorses, always doing what they've been called to do, but in this case, it's clear they are hungry, tired, and they need to rest. And so Jesus encourages them to go away to what he calls in this translation a quiet place. For folks who know this story well, you might have recognized that quiet place replaced deserted place. It's in these quiet or, des or desert places where God so often seems to meet their human creation. So I'm not surprised that in this particular story that the disciples and even Christ himself were called to such a place. That said, I can't help but feel bad for the disciples because they've just returned from a full day of preaching and teaching, going out in groups of two. They've traveled a fair distance back and forth. They've talked a whole lot and they haven't had time to eat. So they accept Jesus' offer to go to a quiet place. They hop in the boat, and then this crowd of people, 5,000 plus strong, rushes to beat them to the destination. I'd be mad as heck. And I wonder how the disciples felt when they saw that crowd coming. How have any of you felt when you've been truly exhausted and someone shows up asking you about literally anything? It sucks. It's unfair. You're tired, you want to be finished, and yet, and yet, you're being asked to give just a little bit more. Sometimes I think that little bit more is not a burden, but rather a blessing. The lens I first offer here is I think one for ministers and lay leadership, and if you don't fit in one of those categories, one day you might. And also I think it's a lesson on scarcity and abundance. If you've ever received an email from me, you've no doubt read the message in part of my signature that I think politely and pastorally says that on my days off, I will not read or reply to any email that you send me. And that's not because I don't care about what you have to say on my days off, but it's because even in this work, I believe that I deserve rest. I deserve to have firm and clear boundaries. And so I create them and I tell you what they are so that we might all respect them. So I'm not going to stand here and suggest that Jesus wanted or even demanded his disciples to go past their own boundaries to work beyond the point of exhaustion. I don't think Jesus would ask us to do that. But I do think that he called them to this place, that he watched a crowd of thousands rush to meet them to that place, and still got off the boat. They could have stayed in the middle of the sea because he wanted the disciples, this particular group of teachers and leaders, to learn something too. The lesson here, I think, is that you are not alone. We are not alone in this work. These 12 had literally just hours before been entrusted with sharing the teachings of Jesus. And now in this moment of, I think, ultimate vulnerability, being tired, hungry, and needing rest, they were completely convinced there was nothing else for them to do. Bless you. But Jesus says, feed them. The disciples protest, and Jesus says, gather what you can. And with exasperation and resignation, the disciples choose to do that. I think the disciples here had a scarcity mindset. They were acting as though all they currently had would be all that they might one day have, 
and they tried to make decisions in that same way. In saying feed them, I think Jesus offers a short lesson challenging them to simply figure it out. Not to overwork them, but I think to remind them that God often meets us exactly where we are. So the disciples indeed gather what they can, and in some versions of this story, the food comes from a young boy. A reminder there, I think, that God's grace can come from the places and people we least expect it to come from. Five loaves of bread, two fish, a massive crowd to feed. Jesus has an abundance mindset. And I think here's where the second lens shows up, the lens of communion. Jesus saw a hungry crowd, sheep without a shepherd, he called them. This crowd was hungry for food, for new knowledge and wisdom, for the teachings of Christ. What better way to teach the stories of this faith than by breaking bread? And so Jesus did that. He took bread, gave thanks for it, broke it, and blessed it. And then he took the fish, and he did the same. Communion. Perhaps not in the style or vein that we practice it today, but context is key. Indeed, on World Communion Sunday, each October, we are reminded and exposed to the various ways that folks all around the world receive communion, how that joyful feast is celebrated around the world, often dependent upon cultural norms, economic conditions, availability of resources, or communal values. This is why in many Pacific Islander areas, they receive communion with a coconut, because at once there is coconut milk the fruit of the vine and the flesh of the coconut, that bread, the body of Christ broken for you, two in one, culture, context, the resources that you have access to. And so in this case, we have bread and we have fish. The ordinary becomes sacred communion. God meets us in our broken bread. And if you doubt that, take a moment just here to consider what communion means to you when we receive it here each month if you're in this service or every week at the early service. And if that's a bit hard, think about coffee, tea, and conversation. Again, not communion as we receive it, but a joyful feast, broken bread, people sharing together in something happy, positive, barriers being broken down. This bread passed around by our children this morning, William, Sophia, Charlie, all serving to us communion. Here, a joyful feast, not planned in any real way other than Reverend Jess bringing some bread. It's gluten-free, to be clear, and us breaking that bread, passing the baskets around, and indeed, loaves, bread, abound. And here is the final lens, because ultimately, I think that this meal is about serving justice. Jesus saw a hungry crowd, and yes, he could have sent them all away to buy food, but instead, he instructs his disciples to feed them. And in this instruction, there is no means test, there is no drug test, no confirmation or, of residency or citizenship, no questions about education or occupation, about politics, about what church you belong to, about who you claim as your God. There are no barriers put up. There is simply a hungry crowd, 12 disciples, five loaves of bread, two fish, one Jesus. There's a blessing, broken bread, and then loaves and fish again abound. Not communion as we celebrate it today, but still Eucharistic. A foreshadowing of things to come, justice served in a world hungry for it to arrive. For they were hungry and they were given food to eat. They were weary and they were given space to rest. And you may have missed this in the story, so I will try to highlight it for you, that Jesus himself did not feed this crowd. The disciples did. And the lesson for that for us is here, that the disciples offered to Jesus what they had. Jesus gave thanks for what they offered, blessed that offering, gave it back to them and said, get to work. And I think there's a call for all of us too, because we can look at all the things that we wish would be right in the world, all the things that are indeed wrong in the world, and we might stand idly by and simply say, gee, I hope that Christ might come sooner to fix this, save this, help us. And yet, what I think Jesus says here is that you actually are enough. 
that what you have in your pocket, what you can find and offer back to me, I will bless and return to you with the hopes that you might be my hands and feet and make this world anew. I think this matters. I think that right here it matters that Jesus gives that charge to them to feed the crowd. I think Christ gives that same call to us. And I'm deeply convinced by the words that Rachel Hutto Evans offers us, this honest truth that our God is in the business of transforming ordinary things into holy things, scraps of food into feasts. This God, our God, knows their way around the world, so there's no need to fear, no need to withhold, to stick a claim, because there's always enough taste and see. There's always and ever enough. My siblings, God shows up in desert places. God shows up in quiet places. God shows up amid the hungry, the tired, the poor, the yearning. God shows up even when we think there's nothing worth God actually showing up for. God shows up for us again and again and again. So my prayer for us this day is that we might allow ourselves to go to a quiet place, a deserted place, that we might in that place hope to find comfort and rest and we might instead be challenged by someone who asks us for help, someone who needs to receive a blessing, that we might accept that call, rise to the occasion, offer to Christ that which we have, knowing that we will receive a blessing back and a charge to carry out and do right and good work. My prayer for us this day, my siblings, is that this story might help us make meaning of the world. Miracles are weird. I'm not going to deny that. They're hard to explain. They're hard to teach, especially in an age where we harp very much more on science and the head more than the heart and faith. It's hard to get folks to believe that anything like this may have happened at all. And yet I think that in this story we're called to suspend our disbelief, to imagine simply that there is a hungry crowd and someone needs to be fed and that a group of people, however small they might have been, set out to fix and solve that challenge. They saw someone who was hungry, so they fed them. A miracle indeed. My prayer is that we might accept the veracity of that miracle, that we might find the belief that it happened once, can happen again, and that we might be part of that 12, part of that small group of committed people who say, I will meet the task at hand. I will teach. I might preach. I will gather a crowd, I will watch a crowd, and if they are hungry or thirsty, I will feed them and give them something to drink because that is the basic, minimum, barest thing I've been called to do. My prayer for us is that we will not have a mindset of scarcity, that we might lean towards the idea of abundance, even when it seems as though there's not that much in our plate, that there's going to be something there. My prayer for us to stay in my siblings is we might simply rise to what Christ has called us to do. May this and all of our prayers be made so. Amen.
prayer concerns with one another. There are a list of prayer concerns already printed in your worship folder, but this is the time where we invite any that are present in the room or those online to share your prayer requests with us so that they may be uh, spoken aloud and held uh, within the context of this body. I do want to make note, uh, which is not listed in your bulletin, that yesterday would have been our beloved friend John Ritt's birthday. And so we remember John even still and remember the impact that he had on us. And uh, John, John's final resting place, though many know that he will rest in our hearts forever, his final resting place is our memorial garden. And, and so if you desire to go and share a word with the spirit of John, I'm sure that he would receive you well in the garden today. Uh, perhaps a happy birthday song might be in order. So we remember John and all those who love him today. Are there others, any within the congregation? I see Gracie and I see Alan with microphones. They are ready to bring them to you. I'm looking at the chat in the back and I don't see any movement. Yes, yeah, Sophia. Hi, um, I'm Sophia Walker. Uh, today is my brother's birthday. Uh, he's turning six years old, and um, his birthday party is right after this. We should sing. sing. I think we need to sing. Um, Josh, can we please? His name is William. Choir. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, William. What a big day. The 10th of March was a great day to be born, and we're so glad that you were born on the 10th of March, six years ago today. <coughs> Wonderful. Are there others? We love celebrations, too. Yes, Hannah, one second. Alan's on the way. Um, so Jess will be happy we're going to sing again because it's Charlie's birthday on Tuesday. <laughs> it's Charlie's birthday on Tuesday! Charlie. One more time! <laughs> And a happy birthday to Charlie. The 12th of March was a great day to be born, and we're glad that you were born on the 12th of March. My wife's birthday is Friday, so March is a great, this is the, the season of the Pisces. She's not here, we don't have to sing. <laughs> Friends, are there others? We, yes, there's, Helen has one, Alan. Yeah, take the microphone for those online. Okay. Uh, we raised almost $500 last night at Lena's place, which will benefit Toco Hills Community Alliance, which a lot of people who volunteer there are participating in the Hunger Walk today with thousands of other people downtown by the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yes. Thanks be to God. $500. That's fantastic. How wonderful. That is great. I'm still looking at the chat. I don't see any movement, I don't think. Will we just check that for me really fast? Thank you. As that is, as we're seeing if there are any in the chat, we do want to remind everyone to go out and vote on Tuesday. It is the presidential primary. Uh, we have one in the back, but yes, let us pray for our country, for all of those that have access and means to get out and vote, not only for our president, but also in our local elections. This is from Charles, excuse me, Charles Boyd. Uh, to everyone, I'm joy, joyful. I finally got my giant dog who doesn't like taking baths bathed and that I spread pine straw in my parents' yard. 
so he won't get as muddy when he visits and plays there. That was from Charles. We give thanks to God for large dogs and also for their cleanliness. All right, friends, well, let us go to God in prayer. I will offer a pastoral prayer for us, and then we will uh, say together the words of our common prayer. Today's prayer is not an extemporaneous one, but in fact, one that comes from the works of John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church um, and many movements of, of Methodism. Um, this is his covenant prayer, which is a prayer that um, I pray often and a prayer that I think suits uh, the time that we live in today. So let us hear the wisdom in these words as we pray John Wesley's covenant prayer. Let us pray. I am no longer my own, O God, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Let me be praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and to your service. And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. Let the covenant which I have made here on earth, let it also be made in heaven. We pray this in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The offering is one of many ways to turn our worship into witness in the world, and it's, I think there is an idea here of scarcity versus abundance mindset, that you have to always offer some really big gift to have an impact, and that is not true. The note we often leave in our first worship bulletin at the end says, all gifts are precious, because indeed they are. The size of the gift does not matter, it's the faith and trust you're placing in it that does. And so if you're online this morning, there should be a link in the chat that you can click to our online offering. If you want to participate in the one great hour sharing, you can designate that gift in the online option there. If you're in the sanctuary again this morning, any loose cash in the plate will be one great hour sharing. And if you designate that gift in an envelope, the same will go there. All other gifts support the ministries of this particular congregation in serving Christ Church. This morning's offering will now be received.
Holy One, we offer these gifts to you, gifts of time, talent, and treasure, with the hope and faith that you might bless them and return it back to us, so that we might carry out your good work and the world that God called into being. This prayer be made so. Amen. And now, my siblings, this last song, it's our closing hymn number 607. It's our fourth time singing this, fourth week in a row. It should sound fantastic. We have a song to sing in this faith. If you believe in a type of faith where we're building something new, where everyone is welcome, where you know that you're not alone, I think these words speak to something like that. And so I hope that you might sing it loud and proud because this song is indeed our song. And I'm being told there's a mic. What? what? I just wanted to add one more offering that was just made, and that is our very own Mary Ellen Myers, who is back from a long illness, a long healing of her arm. Gratitude, Mary Ellen's return. And we're going to sing 607 loud and proud. If you believe in those things and what we're doing, if you believe that we actually can build a newer world, a brighter world, a better world, sing loud, sing proud. This is our song, 607. <laughs>
quick note before you receive our benediction. Um, our stewardship board is hosting coffee, tea, and conversation this afternoon in an effort to encourage you to volunteer to do a few things here around the church. So there will be a clear list of things that are going on that you might want to be involved in. This is one of the first times since I've been here that we've actually printed a full list of things that you can do. So I hope you might take a moment to take a look at that list. There are a bunch of opportunities that range from a really deep commitment to things that are more lighthearted, like helping support kids space and just being with kids in the back there. But that's not easy work, but it is fun and engaging work to help kids make this faith their own. There are about 10 to 12 other things on that list. So again, coffee, tea, conversation in the comments hosted by stewardship to see how you can get involved in supporting all the various ministries here at Central. But for now, my siblings receive this blessing. Here we find a family, a place to grow, community, a place for us to know that we are not alone. You've received an extra hour of daylight this season, so may you use that light to shine that light, share Christ's love and peace with those whom you encounter, and commit to doing the hard work that lies ahead. May you go in peace and share that peace along the way. Amen. Greet your neighbors. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you.